Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Any Sonic fan will hear those words and just think, hell yeah. I'll be honest with you guys, I'm nervous as all hell to review this game. This is not just another Sonic game, but one of the greatest of them all, a genre-defining platformer. I really, really hope I can give this game the justice it deserves. <sighs> well, here we go. It's here. It's all been leading up to this point. We are at the climax of the original Genesis games. It's been a wild ride, but we're here. I am absolutely itching to dive straight into this game, but there's some history you gotta go over first. And don't worry, I have chapters in the description for those who want to skip ahead, but, you know, history's cool. You should watch it. And one more thing before we get started, I want to give a huge shout out to my friend Scourge over on Twitter who did the thumbnail for this, and it looks incredible. I love it so much. Please give him a follow. You know, Commission Sonic stuff if you like it. He's a really good artist, really nice person, really base person. But uh, with that being said, let's get on to the review. Immediately after Sonic 2's release, Sega was already wanting another entry to start development. It's so funny how Sega was so hesitant to make Sonic 2, but suddenly when the series started to be successful, they wanted to make more, but you know, anyway. This time around, it was Yuji Naka who wasn't entirely sure about making a new Sonic, not wanting to make the same things again, which I can respect, but no, it was the promise of working solely with the Japanese half of STI that got Naka not only on board, but was made producer, giving him way more freedom for this project. Yeah, so one thing I left out in the Sonic 2 video is the fact that the Japanese half really didn't like the American half. Remember how I said the US half were used to the 9 to 5 mindset while the Japanese half had their work on life philosophy? Well, apparently rude remarks were being thrown run around towards the American half, and uh, yeah, that's really shitty of the Japanese half. The Sonic 2 crew was really just an oddball team, wasn't it? It was like oil and water. It just didn't go well together. I guess they thought the American team was holding them back or something. Furthering this, Naka and Hirokazu Yashura, who was director, wanted to make this title a huge ambitious project, larger in scope than any Sonic game before, which was basically what they wanted to do with Sonic 2 originally which had a lot of its planned content removed due to large time constraints. This new game would be so big that the talk of splitting it into two was being considered during early development. Sonic 3 was seriously so big and innovative that the limits of the Genesis was being pushed to new heights. Seriously awesome. In fact, Sega was also playing around with the idea of having the game being in its own 24 megabit cartridge, which for those who didn't know, sometimes Sega would include bigger games in their own special cartridges. One of these would have been used for the entire Sonic 3 Knuckles experience, which honestly would have been really neat. Getting back on track, the SDI team had a lot of new members coming in from Japan, notably up-and-coming game designer Tashi Izuka. It begins. Izuka very much enjoyed Sonic 2, however he thought he could improve the formula by adding more playable characters with different abilities. Sure, Sonic 2 had Tails, but he was functionally no different from Sonic. Yes, he could fly, as we all know, but there wasn't anything in-game that differentiated him in such a way. He just played like Sonic. Adding different characters would heavily increase the replayability. A larger raw that could experience different parts of levels by using said unique abilities. With all that being said, the team agreed that a new rival for Sonic would be introduced. They originally wanted it to be another hedgehog, but instead another internal competition would decide which animal this new character would be. While some new characters were being presented to a select number of children, a Echidna character would be the most popular choice, except for the fact it was green. Kids didn't really vibe with green Knuckles, which led to the color being changed to red. Knuckles the Echidna was born. What made Knuckles distinct from Sonic or Tails was his lack of focus on speed. Instead, Knuckles was a powerhouse. His iconic spike gloves aren't just used to showcase his strength. He can also use them to break down boulders, walls, and other objects that Sonic can't deal with. Another aspect of Knuckles' character design is his crest, which was originally supposed to be a Nike logo. Sega was trying to get a Nike sponsorship for Sonic 3, but it fell through. The Knuckles' crest is a remnant of that. Pretty nifty. This made Knuckles stand out from the rest. Oh boy, did it work. Knuckles is undoubtedly one of the best inclusions in the entire franchise, ranking pretty high on the most iconic Sonic characters in my personal opinion. I love his personality too. Knuckles isn't the sharpest crayon, but he's intelligent in his own way, being the guardian of the Master Emerald, knowing a lot about his island, while wondering about his origin as the last member of his kind. I'm not a fan on how he was treated in the main series, from Heroes up until about Sonic Frontiers. It's like he was the Patrick of the Sonic universe, just a a dumb sidekick who is stupid in all aspects, but when Knuckles is done right, man, I love this character. In a lot of ways he reminds me of Piccolo, who was once a rival turned friend, which spoiler alert, Knuckles starts off as the antagonist in this game, but I think everyone knows that. In all, Knuckles was a fantastic addition to the series.
While designing the zones that Sonic 3 would hold, the team took inspiration from the real world, taking notes from trips the group would take on to get away from production. You know the first part of Ice Cap Zone? Yeah, that was inspired off of a real snowboarding trip the team took. Carnival Night took inspiration from local carnivals that were taking place, and I just think that's the coolest thing in the entire world. One of my favorite parts of the Sonic world is how realism clashes with the cartoony world in the most perfect way possible. This takes that and brings it to the next level. 14 zones were laid out for the game. As said earlier, the game was being developed for the possibility of being split into two. However, a McDonald's promotion of all things was approaching fast. Sonic 3 was due to come out in February, so the team needed to hone in on the split game aspect, swap some zones around, and polish the first six, slap the ending onto the last one, get their Happy Meals on, and focus on the next half. For example, Ice Cap was supposed to be after Flying Battery. Sonic would have used the door after busting through the ship as a snowboard in Ice Cap. The team tried their hardest to make Sonic 3, the first half, stand on its own. Did they achieve this? Well, In February of 1994, on Groundhog's Day, being changed to Hedgehog's Day, Sonic the Hedgehog 3 was released onto the world, came out to critical acclaim. No shocker there, most publications not only called it the best in the series, but one of the greatest platformers, period. There was very little criticism to be had, but few did mention the game's length. Some felt Sonic 3 was too short for the price, especially compared to Sonic 2, but it didn't take players long to find the level select, which had names of stages that were being planned later for the second half of the game. This was when people started to find out about the entire, like, this was part one sort of deal. And I'll be honest, I couldn't see this any other way. I think this whole ordeal is, well, for one, something that can only happen in the 90s. Let's not get ourselves here. And two, I actually think this was for the best. Let's say for a minute here, Sega did actually do a 24 megabit cartridge. It would have been way more expensive than your typical game, meaning not as many people would be able to experience the game. And before anyone says it, I do know this is going to be Japan only, but that's all we know. They could have been planning this worldwide if this Ronald tie-in didn't happen, but that's just my theory. That being said, Sonic 3 standalone being success, both review and critic wise, the team could focus on the next half of the game. The team really wanted people to play the game as originally intended, so they developed the second half's cartridge to be attachable to Sonic 3. Think a tokusatsu style mecha but with a Sonic game cartridge, which means it's objectively one of the coolest things in the entire world, but no, seriously though, they marketed this as lock-on technology, which means once you lock on the Sonic 3 game cartridge, the entirety of Sonic 3 could be experienced, all three characters from the game go, more bonus stages, and 14 special stages would be played. All together, no parts 1s or 2s, just one big game. Knowing that some people might be a little miffed about buying two games to get the full experience, Sega added some value to the lock-on gimmick. If you plugged in Sonic 2, you would get to play the entire game as Knuckles, which is… wow. The fact that this lock-on thing can affect games that weren't even designed to use was just the coolest thing ever. And oh boy did this marketing work. This blew people's minds back in the day. And you know what? It's still impressive. This blew my mind as a kid. They also wanted to include Knuckles in Sonic 1, but due to some time constraints and issues getting it right, instead it would bring you to this no way screen and give the option to play randomly generated blue sphere levels. It is actually randomly generated which means it's literally almost infinite blue sphere to play. Ho 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 ho, we will talk about this later. I know this is some hard copium and is likely impossible, but how cool would it have been if this could also work with Sonic CD? Like having an and Knuckles cartridge alongside a copy of Sonic CD to give you Knuckles in Sonic CD. I know it's stupid, I'll stop. But yeah. In October of 1994, Sonic and Knuckles were released to, again, critical acclaim both from fans and critics, this time more emphasis being placed on playing the game with not only Sonic and Knuckles, but Sonic 3. This was the way the game was always originally intended to play, and it's considered to be one of the best 2D platforms ever made for its time and to this day. Now, do I agree with this? But that's it for the history. Let's get right into the game. Uh, why are you looking at me like that? As stated before, Sonic 3 and Knuckles is the full, originally intended experience. Thus, this will be the way I review the game. Playing both separately leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, the end screen of Sonic 3 screams, we need to ship this game out next week, hurry up. Also, in the title screen of Sonic and Knuckles, it literally picks up right where the first half leads off. Not to mention, you can't get the Super Emeralds in either half of the game, so there's little reason to do so. However, there are small differences in the game separate that are notable enough to cover. It would bother me chronically if I didn't go over them, considering this is a comprehensive documentary review. One of the 
the smaller differences is the sound effects. The 1-up jingle, invincibility, knuckles, and the act 1 mini boss themes are totally different. Now I do prefer the 1-up jingle. The mini boss and knuckles themes I'm pretty indifferent about. The mini boss theme in particular is a bit more goofy. However, the invincibility track gives me flashbacks. There was a time where this was my alarm clock in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> needless to say, it was absolute hell. I would hear this in my head at random times of the day, in my dreams, and I remember one day at work I thought I heard it in the other room, so I ran to get my phone, only to realize the alarm clock never went off. Yeah, needless to say, I changed it, and every time I hear it, I get that same panic feeling. <laughs> Bigger differences start final boss of the game. This is known as Big Arms, and people love this boss fight. And yeah, it's, it's good. I don't think it's worth playing Sonic 3 alone if I'm being honest. Like, sure, it's cool. However, I personally feel like this was added in last minute to make the ending of Sonic 3 feel more... Complete. In the full game, this is Knuckles' boss fight, and I think it fits better for Knuckles. It's a bit more tricky without Sonic's abilities. My opinion here is definitely wrong because this boss was added back into the full game in Sonic Origins because people loved it so much. But let's be clear, this is just my opinion. I don't think Big Arms not being here takes anything away from Sonic 3 and Knuckles personally. Lastly, for Sonic 3, the ending credits song is different, and I quite like it. It's catchy. As for Sonic and Knuckles, there's no saving feature, no playable tales, and no super emeralds. This is clearly not meant to be played by itself. At least with Sonic 3, it was some effort. But for Sonic and Knuckles? Nah, this screams, for the love of god, please plug in Sonic 3. That is it for standalone nonsense. Let's review Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles. Hell yeah. This is the best title screen of all time. I don't care what anyone says. Starting the game won't result in the beginning zone. This time it takes you to the level select. This is awesome. Sonic CD was the first Sonic game to have a saving feature, but Sonic 3 Knuckles was the first to actually utilize the fact that it could save. There are plenty of save files here that even show your lives and continues. This is just neat. Also, this music. The level select theme is among my favorite Sonic songs of all time. It puts me into that happy place. It makes me reflect on just life. Also, this is where you can pick any character you want to play as, and this is objectively better than having go to the settings like in Sonic 2. Alright, now it's time we dive right into the story, and this is one of my most favorite aspects of this game, and I really can't wait to share it with you guys. Right as Sonic is dealing the final blows to the Death Egg, far away in an island that is only rumored to exist in myth, a floating land known as Angel Island, Knuckles the Echidna was attending his duties. Knuckles is the last of his own kind. The only thing Knuckles knows about his past is the role he must take, guarding the Master Emerald, Suddenly, the Master Emerald begins to shine. Confused by this, Knuckles didn't have much time to react. Little did he know, the Death Egg collided with Angel Island, shaking the land to its core, causing it to fall into the sea, which hasn't happened in centuries. Well, it's about to happen a lot more. Knuckles wakes up and soon realizes that the emerald is gone. Looking to the distance, he notices an egg-shaped object. Wondering if this is the egg of the legendary dragon, Knuckles ventures off across the island to find his lost emerald. After checking every emerald altar to no avail, the Echidna continues the search. During his adventures, he comes across Dr. Eggman, as he was also taking a stroll through the hidden palace zone where the villainous doctor discovers the legend of the island and the chaos emeralds. Knuckles questions Eggman. The doctor smiles and yaps to the gullible Echidna that he was exploring scientists trying to study the egg that appeared. Eggman continued by saying he was aware of the emeralds and that there was an evil hedgehog named Sonic who had all seven. Knuckles, who believed everything, ran off in search of Sonic. Meanwhile, Sonic and Tails were taking a well-deserved rest after what they just went through a few days prior. As Sonic gazes over the beach, he notices a ring washes ashore. Picking it up and noticing an ancient text carved into the ring, Sonic recalls a myth he heard a long time ago about an ancient tribe that lived in peace and harmony on a faraway land. The people attributed their prosperity to a quote-unquote stone of power. Sooner or later, there were greedy souls who wished to use the gem for their own selfish gain. Once they try to harness the emerald's power, they failed and wiped out their own civilization in no time. The gods rebuilt the land into the sky using said stone of power. It was at this moment where Tails notified Sonic that his newly invented emerald radar was going off. Lacking the thought of a new adventure, the two fly off on Sonic's airplane, their tornado. As they get closer to the radar's readings, Sonic decides to speed up by using this recently acquired chaos emerald and transforming into his super form. Once they reach the island, Sonic is caught off guard. Knuckles comes up from the ground and punches Sonic out of his super form, 
and takes the emeralds. Sonic now has to travel through Angel Island and recollect the emeralds before Eggman is able to relaunch the Death Egg, and little does he know, Eggman has built a new army of badniks. Sonic and Tails make their way through varying areas of Angel Island. They run into Knuckles quite a few times, Knuckles trying to stop them, or let's be real, trying to be a dick and slightly inconveniencing Sonic at almost every turn. Meanwhile, Eggman is making his preparations to relaunch the Death Egg. Thankfully, Sonic comes in just in the nick of time to spoil the Doctor's plans. Sonic lands in Mushroom Hill Zone. There he notices Knuckles peer his eyes outside of a walkthrough. Once he leaves, Sonic wanders in and finds a special ring, warping into Hidden Palace, where the Master Emerald lies. The Chaos Emeralds react with the Master Emerald and transform into powerless, larger gems known as the Super Emeralds. What are the Super Emeralds? Well, we actually don't really know. They haven't appeared since. Not counting the Power Down Super Emeralds we see in Mania, Izuka said the Super Emeralds reside in a different dimension, but that can mean literally anything because 1. This dude hates the Super Emeralds for no reason, and 2. The Special Rings lore-wise takes Sonic through another dimension, so again, it could mean anything. But alas, to get the Emerald's power, Sonic has to once again go through the special stages, each one restoring a single Super Emerald. Before long, Sonic encounters Knuckles for the final time. Once defeated, Eggman goes behind his back and tries to harness the Master Emerald for his own bidding. Knuckles realizing he was fooled by the Doctor, desperately attempts to get the Emerald back, but gets the shocking treatment. <gasps> That's a little dark for a Sonic game, don't you think? Whatever happened to Eggman kidnapping animals? Knuckles gives Sonic the, my bad bro, misclick treatment and helps Sonic get to the next area, Guy's Sanctuary. Eggman uses the Master Emerald to relaunch the Death Egg, and with it his army of robots. Knuckles tells Sonic to get a move on without him, since he got shocked pretty bad. Did he shoo me? He fucking shooed me! Sonic runs off in hot pursuit of the Death Egg. The only thing getting his way is Mecha Sonic, which is Eggman's latest Sonic counterpart. Oh, we'll talk about you later, buddy. But he goes down just as easy as the rest. Sonic blasts his way through the Death Egg, and in no time at all confronts Dr. Robotnik for the last time. Just when Sonic thinks it's over, Eggman takes the Master Emerald and makes a run for it in another Death Egg Robo. With everything exploding around him, Sonic has no choice. Sonic uses his new transformation, Hypersonic, to chase down the evil Doctor at one of the most climactic space chases all time in reclaiming the Master Emerald. Fuck, it's so peak. It's so pink. Sonic successfully destroys the Death Egg robot and saves the entire universe from Eggman's hands, returning the Master Emerald to their new friend as they fly away with Angel Island returning to its rightful place in the sky. And that's it for the story of Sonic 3 and Knuckles. This is the embodiment of peak, and it would be the stepping stones for what the Avenger games would soon follow. This is seriously one of the coolest stories in any Sonic game. I really don't know why some dumbasses think this game doesn't have a story, but this is our first ever high-stakes Sonic story. It in every way defines what I love about Sonic stories, and sets things up for future games. I mean, let's not get ahead of ourselves here, but it straight up teases chaos. Again, as I said in the Sonic 2 video, do people even know what their favorite games are about? Sure, some of it's in the manual, but most of it's straight up told in game. In fact, the way Sonic 3 Knuckles perfectly integrates story and gameplay Play is absolutely amazing. There is a beginning, middle, and end. It's perfect. The game's cutscenes are just straight up ambitious. Watching the Death Egg fall right before Mushroom Hill, seeing it rise in the background of Sky Sanctuary and watching the Egg Robos fly out of it, Sonic running up the pillars of Sky Sanctuary to reach the Death Egg, it's literally what Peak stands for. Instead of the manual just telling you what happens, it actually shows you what happens. The manual just gives some additional context for the beginning of the game. Now let's get something clear. I'm not mad because of some old heads who don't know what they're talking about. I'm mad because people don't give the story the credit it deserves. Recently, we've been seeing the rebellion of people who think Sonic can't have serious stories is just straight up dumb. There are many, and I mean many other cartoons and video games that have ridiculous concepts or even goofy cartoon characters with serious, or as I prefer, cool high-stakes stories. In fact, I've seen these same people who say Sonic can't do this cry over Pokemon or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Sonic is no different. No matter how badly you want to believe it, the Mega Drive 
five games were never about Eggman kidnapping animals. Each one of these have their own story, and they were taken seriously by the people who wrote them. The sheer amount of lore in Sonic 3 alone is outstanding. The mural in Hidden Palace that foreshadows the final battle in space, these weird Sonic looking statues in Hydro City, hell, the entire mystery behind the Super Emeralds. Sonic 3 started what I miss most about the Sonic franchise, its world building. I'm glad we're just now getting back to that with Sonic Frontiers, but man, is Sonic 3 how you write a Sonic story? This and the next two games in the series get it right. It's cool, it has some light moments, sometimes it has some darker elements, and overall ends in a world ending threat. Seriously, once you're in space and see the planet at Earth below you, you know you're in for a peak Sonic game. I can gush about this for hours. The story in this game gets me hyped to play it. I'm cheering as I'm fighting Eggman in space. I'm on the edge of my seat watching Sonic run up the breaking altar. I'm getting pissed when Knuckles takes away my emeralds I worked so hard for in the previous game. This story immerses you into wanting to know what happens next. It helps greatly that the story and gameplay are very much intertwined. You see the effects of Eggman's empire taking over in real time. Angel Island Zone is a great example. You watch as this beautiful jungle gets overrun with robots and catches on literal fire. You see it getting bombed, swarmed with other robots. It's cool. This game screams in ambition in every sense of the word, and believe it or not, this is only one piece of the scrumptious cake. Everything you've seen up until now is one fifth. What you've seen up until now is one fifth. <laughs> Let's start off with how this game looks graphically, and man, is Sonic 3K one of the most gorgeous Genesis games I have ever seen. The detail and sprite quality are amazing. That's not to say the previous titles weren't good looking, but man, this takes it up so many notches it's almost surprising this game is on the same console as the others. And we get new sprites for Sonic the Boot, and man, this sprite is amazing. Some weren't thrilled with the sprite, and I can't imagine why. This is just a visual upgrade in every way. I love the determined look he has when he runs. I love the idle animations. Some would argue simplicity for the old sprite, but I think the more detailed the better. Not to mention Tails. His sprite remains the same but has added details, so it doesn't look out of place next to Sonic. And I love his colors. And our new character Knuckles has some great looking sprites as well. But I'll be honest, his tripping animations just look weird to me. I don't know why, but they just always weirded me out. There's nothing wrong with it, just I don't really... No, it, it's weird, okay? Graphics are one thing, but how does the game itself stand up? Well, Sonic 3 Knuckles has undoubtedly the best gameplay in the entire classic lineup. Yep, even compared to Sonic Mania and Sonic Superstars, the latter I'll get into later, but for the former, in every way this game refines and perfects the formula of Sonic the Hedgehog. Small additions to the gameplay greatly improve the experience for me. Remember the shield? It was kinda boring. I mean, it did its job, protecting Sonic and all, but Sonic 3 takes it up three notches because we get other shields with their own abilities, known as the elemental shields. Let's start with the fire shield, which protects against fire hazards and allows Sonic to do a mid-air dash. The electric shield, that protects against certain badnik projectiles and gives Sonic a double jump and attracts rings towards Sonic. Last but certainly not least, the bubble shield, which allows Sonic to remain in water without needing to stop for air, and you get to do this fun bounce thing, which can help you reach certain areas. These three little monitors do such a wonderful job at adding so much spice to this adventure. All three of these abilities are beautifully balanced between each other. There's not a single shield that's better. All of them have their own purpose, and depending on where you are in the level, you want to use a different shield. The devs knew this and placed them in such a manner. Need a fire shield? Well, there's probably one nearby. Even though I like the electric shield the best, I love them all for their own reasons. The fire shield allows me to be careless in front of fire hazards, which is really fun. The electric shield lets me rack up a shit ton of rings, and the bubble shield allows me to keep the pace going underwater. In fact, let me give the biggest praise to the bubble shield. Not because it overshadows the others, but the fact that it addresses the number one criticism with these games, the underwater parts. Sure, you move a bit slower when submerged, but finally having something to allow you to breathe under water is a game changer. It keeps the pace going. I don't have to stop every few seconds to get air. I can just go. I think the greatest part about these shields is the fact they aren't tickets to win the level. They are tools that assist you in very specific situations and can be easily taken away from you. You need skill to retain the ability. For every enemy that's weak against a certain shield, there's three others that can effortlessly take it away from you. I think this is truly brilliant game design. Now there's a new element of suspense. I don't want to lose my super cool fire shield. And that leads me on to my next point. While the elemental shields are super versatile and great to use, I never feel like I'm crippled without it and that's because in addition to the new power-ups, Sonic's own natural moveset gets a new ability. 
and it's one of the best sonic abilities of all time, the Insta Shield. Now let's get something out of the way. The Insta Shield isn't actually a shield of any kind. This move extends Sonic's hitbox and makes him invincible for a very, very brief time. This is good for enemies with spikes like Orbanauts. Actually, no, it's good for literally everything because oh my gosh, this move is so fun to use. The slight extension of the hitbox literally murders all bosses. And the fact you were invincible makes it so fun to get yourself out of hairy situations. It's a bit tricky to get the timing right, but once you learn, it's like learning a bike. You never forget how to use it properly. It's broken in the absolute best way possible. Not in an unfinished cringe way, but in a fun busted way. It's so fun I often use it over being supersonic. Yeah, it's that fun. This one ability for Sonic manages to change the gameplay completely. It feels so refreshing to not just defeat enemies by jumping on them. And this move is skill based. It teaches the player how timing works. And if you get the timing right, you're rewarded with this busted move, which adds to the fun factor. It also does a great job at expanding your reflexes. This shield adds so much to make this game feel like the new Sonic game. You now have an alternative method of attacking badniks. This is by far the best ability in any 2D Sonic game, period. It's criminal how it hasn't returned in Mania Superstars as Sonic's main moveset. Even the game's structure was slightly altered. Well, yes, the two act zones from Sonic 2 returns, it's been tweaked. Instead of a signpost that ended in the first act, we get to fight a mini boss instead. I love the mini bosses of Sonic 3. They add so much variety to the gameplay. Instead of a boring signpost, we get to fight a boss instead. And difficulty being easy or not doesn't really matter. They're fun at the end of the day. I would rather take fun and easy bosses over unfun long bosses. Is it technically too easy if I cheese the Angel Island mini boss with my fire shield? Yes. Is it also super entertaining? Also yes. The best thing about the layout is the fact Act 2 always takes place from where the first one left off. There's never a fade to black with the new title screen. It's beat the mini boss, fuck around with the signpost for a few minutes, which is super fun to do by the way, and then Act 2. Act 2 transitions make the world of Sonic feel more real. Not to mention, sometimes Act 2 takes place in an entirely different portion of the stage. For example, Sinopolis Act 2 takes place inside of the pyramid. Lava Wreath gets deeper and more blue as you descend also connecting itself to Hidden Palace. Angel Island catches on fire mid-level, going in and out of the caves and ice cap. Every act feels fresh. There's always something new to see. Even the music changes every act. This seals the deal. In other games, I always felt like it was just one place in a huge world, while in Sonic 3, it feels like I'm actually going through this huge journey. There's always something exciting to see around every corner. There's not a single level I find dull or straight up bad here. And while I still think Sonic 2 does a good job of having some speedy moments with a good platform, Sonic 3 takes what that game does and makes it infinitely better. There are still times in Sonic 2 where I feel like the game actively stops you from using your speed. In fact, many feel Sonic 2 gets weaker by its second half. Sonic 3 takes the whole roller coaster concept and rolls with it. What I mean is, instead of having speed sometimes, Sonic 3's platforming is designed with speed in mind. Dare I say, it was perfected. Everything is brought together around the idea of going fast. Level gimmicks like Sanopolis Act 2, where you have to keep turning the lights back on, will still involve you going fast, just making the occasional stop to pull a lever, sometimes even having to use your speed to get to said lever. Even water-based levels like Hydro City is anything but slow. Sonic runs so fast, he literally runs on water. Badass. Sonic Sonic 3 is also the first game that was truly designed with the spin dash in mind, and it really shows. It all flows together perfectly. It never feels like the act of going fast is being hindered by poor level design, or doing something for the sake of a good future. And the zones are even more fun to play because of it. This is a good time to mention that the speed cap has been completely obliterated, grinded to dust. There's nothing stopping you from going so fast the screen can barely keep up. Hell, even the manual warns the player about going too fast. Yeah. No joke, Sonic 3 doesn't hold any punches. In many ways, it feels like what Sega originally envisioned Sonic to be. It's non-stop speed action the entire game. There's not a single level here that makes you take things slow. You are always on the move, doing tricky platforming, going so fast it makes Sonic CD look slow. The zones themselves this time around are huge. These levels are beautifully designed and are sprawling with secrets and pathways, some of which you can play the game for years and still never discover. Not to mention they are pretty sized, especially compared to the first three games that had levels that took maybe 45 seconds to two minutes to beat. It always left me wanting more, but here each level is paced perfectly. The shortest ones are clocking in about three minutes and the longer ones are about five. I always feel super satisfied after clearing an act in Sonic 3 Knuckles. With 14 zones in total, there's a lot to dive into. These zones are ginormous. Just as I said a little bit ago, you can play this game for years and barely scratch the surface of what this game truly has to offer. There's so much to these, so 
many different pathways, literally just by going through a different direction, whether being upward or downward, will result in a completely different pathway. Now, the natural question is, does the game scope sacrifice the gameplay, such as Sonic CD? Absolutely not. The most captivating aspect of Sonic 3 is the fact that exploration was also integrated with the idea of going super fast. The game will constantly tease you, it'll give you hints. Huh, I wonder what these platforms lead to. Hmm, I see platforms that disappear. I wonder if I can find something cool. Thoughts like these always fill my mind when it comes to Sonic 3's level design. Exploring here isn't required to get to the end, and unlike Sonic CD, the core gameplay isn't altered to fit its bigger scope, and you don't have to go up to explore. It's all designed like a linear Sonic game, but with extra pathways you can take along the way. Each character can experience different portions of the level, Knuckles can climb and glide, and Tails can fly, meaning you you can see some stuff Sonic can't. Wow, I wasn't expecting that. Is what I would say if I was an annoying Nintendo YouTuber. Not to mention, the game itself gives you tools to explore. Remember when I was gassing up the elemental shields? They were placed specifically in areas where they could be get to use to either reach a higher portion of the level, or access another part that would be impossible without. And you were rewarded in spades for doing so. Rings, extra lives, and even more shields. I love racking up my points in this game. The number gets so high and it's so much fun. I challenge myself to get higher score every run through. It's perfect. This is a great time to bring up the special stages. Sonic 3 and Knuckles handle special stages totally different from the past games. Instead of getting 50 rings by the end of an act or passing through a star post, hidden throughout the level of these big special rings that serve the way to access these stages. And the best part is, there are more than one of them in each stage, which means if you go out of your way to explore some, special stages are often another reward. And oh ho 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 boy, this is a perfect way to encourage the player to explore. With levels this big, I would want to encourage the player to just move Move around, explore the great lands of Angel Island. Sometimes you might have to push a bed of spikes, go left and spend ash into some rubble, or just find them by complete accident. This plays a huge part in why this game has outstanding game design. What if you don't want to explore? Don't fret, you can easily stumble upon these by playing normally, but if you want to explore and memorize the level's layouts, you can get supersonic super early, like I'm talking by the second zone. I do this all the time. There are four big rings in Angel Island alone. Yeah. It's that easy, once you learn, and it's great. Sonic 3 gives you options on how you want to play, and you know how much I love options. This is as good as a time as any to talk about the special stages because <gasps> these are the best special stages to grace a Sonic game. They are so much fun and addictive. The entire premise is that you have to clear out all the blue sphere in a stage. If you clear the outer row, it often takes the inside sphere with it, which turns big areas of blue sphere into rings. The stage also gets faster and faster each row you clear, which makes it so intense and fun. I have plenty of oh shit moments while playing these. The best part about these is the fact that it's skill based, not bad luck or RNG based like the first three games, meaning they are totally fair, and if I mess up, it's my fault, and I can't get enough of these. Whenever you get 50 rings, you get it to continue, which gives so much satisfaction of actually playing these. Even if you get all the rings in a stage, you get a perfect. It's almost like a game within a game. They put so much effort into these and it shows. Also the music here is so hypnotizing. Whenever I play one of these, the music gets me really in the mood. I'm not kidding either. Sometimes I'll be in my room or around my house and I'll just find myself moving like I'm actually in one of the blue sphere. It's like the Tetris effect, but way more autistic. Seriously, if there was a blue sphere guy, he's me. I would love a spin-off game based around this. I'm really thankful Mania brings it back as a mini game, and even more thankful that Sonic 1 doesn't work with Sonic and Knuckles, so I can play new blue sphere levels until I die. And the best part is, there's 14 main special stages to get through, 7 for the regular emeralds, and another for the super emeralds. Once you get the first 7, you're rewarded with a Super Sonic, which makes his grand return from Sonic 2, and he's just as fun to use here, and looks way cooler to boot. Green eyes, huh? Interesting. Once you get the Mushroom Hill, the first special ring would take you to Hidden Palace, and your emeralds were transformed into the Super Emeralds, as mentioned in the story. These are how you get to play the rest of the Blue Sphere, and my lord, they are way harder than the first batch. I adore this so much. These are way harder than the first batch. But, if you get all of them, huge if, you're rewarded with an even higher level of transformation. 
hypersonic. Look, I know Sonic having multiple levels of transformation is semi-controversial in the community, but do you guys want me to be brutally honest? I don't give a single fuck what anyone says. Hypersonic is one of the coolest things I have ever, ever seen in my entire life. Not only is he faster than regular Super Sonic, not only is he stronger than Super Sonic, he just looks so cool! He has after images when he flies, he has aura going around him at all times, he even has a mid-air dash! His coloring is probably the coolest thing of them all. He flashes a bunch of different colors, like a rainbow but it's super fast. I know this is seizure inducing, but it looks so 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 cool! Maybe they ever brought Hypersonic back, which they won't. Maybe they could have a slow fade of all the colors. And when he goes faster, the colors get faster. Almost like the Master Onion in Pikmin 3. But I think we can all mutually agree on him being white if he was just one color. Which is cool, but do you know what? I like bleeding my eyes out looking at him. <sighs> I love Hypersonic so much. I don't know. I always liked the idea of Sonic having multiple levels of transformation. I mean, Super Sonic itself was literally designed after Super Saiyan. Why can't we take more out of that book? I would argue Hyper is more special because they made a unique transformation. I don't know if it devalues Super Sonic at all, especially because Hyper is never used. Hyper itself is just such a mysterious transformation. There's hardly anything known about it, other than it being what the Super Emerald transforms Sonic into. And this motherfucker hates Hyper and refuses to bring him back. Did you know apparently Ian Flynn pitched the idea of Hypersonic versus the end, but Sonic Team turned it down? Of course they did. I would pay so much money to see that, but I guess it's just not meant to be. I mean, he doesn't have to be in every single Sonic game, but at least once every 10 years or something. <sighs> but alas, Hypersonic is one of the coolest things to exist, and I'm happy he's here. It's easily my favorite reward in doing any task in a video game ever, and he's even more fun to use. That's not all though, even Knuckles and Tails get in on the super form action, Knuckles just getting faster and a stronger upgrade, which is cool. I know this is butt of many jokes, but I actually love that he turns pink. Pink is one of my favorite colors aside from red and blue together, pink is just for badasses. But Tails? Oh my gosh, they really made up for him not having a super form in Sonic 2. Hyper Tails is insane! He has what we like to call the flick army of death. No joke, these are Flickies but super. Yeah, like their own golden yellow Super Saiyan bird form and everything. Flickies can be golden but Amy can't? Sure, okay. Getting back on topic though, these little dudes are busted. They will kill everything they come into contact with, even bosses. This is just fun to watch. I love this. The funniest part of the form is the fact if Tails loses his transformation, the Flickies will just fly away. Like, fuck you, no more yellow? I'm out. I almost forgot to mention the bonus stages. Yes, once you go past the star post, 25 rings are over, you are able to play one of three bonus stages. One is a gumball machine that gives you power-ups, one is you have to escape the orbs of death, and finally the slot machines. These are really fun and provide a good break from the crazy gameplay. I use these as a way to get as many rings as possible. I think it's prime time I get into the zones themselves because, oh man, there is so much to dig into with these. Starting with the first zone, Angel Island is a really good starting level. It teaches you everything you need to know about Sonic 3. Its first special ring is right at the beginning. All three elemental shields are used at least once. It perfectly showcases act transitions and the fact everything catches on fire is a great set piece to let us know, hey, this is a real place. You're going to watch it change over time. And lastly, it shows a player that there are multiple pathways. The platforming to get to the upper half can be really involved. Angel Island may not be my favorite starting zone, but I can't deny that it's objectively the best. Hydro City and yes, it's Hydro City, is the best water level in the entire franchise. This is such a tightly designed yet expansive zone. You'll be doing a lot in this level. The underwater segments only last a moment and I actually quite like them. It never feels like I'm going to drown at all. And for a water level, it's arguably the fastest in the entire game. This is just the dopamine zone. It's so satisfying to play. Launching yourself upward using all that momentum never felt any better. Marvel Garden visually is really, really amazing. While it's not my favorite, the scope of the zone itself is really jaw-dropping. It feels like you're working your way through some lost abandoned maze or something. It's really unique and I can't really define what sort of theme it has. It's close to aquatic ruin of Sonic 2 but without any of the aquatic elements. It's like an old civilization used to live here. There are puzzles to do before opening up a new area. Maybe puzzle is a bad word for it, but you do things like spin dashing off these wheels, which by the way I love standing on them before spin dashing. It's really fun. You can also defeat these guys who shoot arrows from their mouth. More aquatic ruin references. You can also scale the level by grabbing onto these pull cords, or by riding on this Beyblade. Hmm. I wonder if that works.
Aww. Marble Garden is undoubtedly one of the most unique zones in the game and it stands out with its brilliant game design. You're constantly going in all directions. Before Sonic games would mostly go to the right with the occasional left turn, but here it's all over the place. You may have to go up to progress, hell, maybe even downward. This I think adds so much spice to the general Sonic 3 level design, it makes it stand out. It always feels fresh. None of these zones blend together. Carnival Night, while being my personal least favorite Sonic 3 zone, still has a lot to love about its level design. It's very busy, and I love it for that. Carnivals are typically really distracting, constantly having obstacles making it hard to get through, and here it's the same way. There's obstacles that try to slow you down, and it's really fun to try to avoid them. Ooh. Say, ooh. Okay, fine, I'll talk about that one part in Carnival Night. So the barrel in Carnival Night is super infamous for some reason. The entire premise of this barrel is you press up and down while you're on the barrel. It'll move up and down, keep the momentum, and it'll get higher and higher for some unknown reason. So many people didn't think to try this and got time overs. Absolutely no offense to anyone who's ever confused by this as a kid, but like, why wouldn't you try everything on the controller? If you were just spamming A, B, and C for 10 minutes and still not knowing what to do, that's kind of your fault for being a dumbass. It took me like, a minute or two to understand this. It's like that one part in Chemical Plant, except there I can understand at least. Being underwater will increase the nerve factor. Here it's just... Come on, dude. Ice Cap is one of my favorites in the entire game. It's cool. It's chill. The cavern vibes is nailed here. The music helps tenfold. I will die on the original hill. This theme just fits the cool and collected vibe perfectly. Ice and snow theme levels in games are always some of my most favorites, but I always hate playing them because most of them have the annoying ice physics. Some of my least favorite mechanics in any video game. Here, nowhere to be found. It's pure bliss. Ice Cap is the perfect ice level. It's a shame that it's the shortest zone in the entire game. Also, the snowboarding part is just so freaking raw. Sonic is just a badass. Launch base feels triumphant. I love, love the colors that are used in the stage. The purple and yellow clashing with each other just works and makes it stand out between all the other mechanical themed zones in the franchise. In the context of the story, Eggman is trying to rebuild the Death Egg. This is going to be huge and we have to put an end to it. There's a lot at stake here, and I really enjoy the challenge of this level. It always keeps me on my toes. Mushroom Hill is a fantastic breather level to take a break from the craziness of launch base and for the levels we're about to get into. I always really like the things that stick to Sonic and nearly the spin dash out of it. I get a huge enjoyment out of bouncing up and down on the mushrooms. Flying Battery is another really unique stage. I like the idea of hitching a ride on one of Eggman's airships. This is also a level that really rewards you for knowing its secrets like this 1-up you can get by knowing where to jump. It's the little things in this game that make it what it is. Going inside and outside of the airship is another really cool touch. Now, I know for a fact I'll get some hate for this, but I don't even care. Sanopolis is hands down my favorite zone in Sonic 3. Let's start with the fact this stage looks Gorgeous! Sand themed levels in video games are always my least favorite. They look so boring, just different shades of yellow and orange, but not in Sonic 3. The sun looks so beautiful, it's purple fading into red. Its use of green also spices things up so well. I love the obstacles too. Scaling down these lines, jumping up the sand, and being launched up. It's so fun. Hell, I love Act 2 even more. You actually go inside the pyramid and accidentally unleash these ghosts. To keep them in check, you have to keep turning on the lights, and if you don't, they'll start to attack you once things get dark. This is so cool! I love this gimmick because it's designed around Sonic going fast. Gotta go fast before the lights dim. Gotta go fast before the walls go back up. I've said this before, but it makes the world feel more alive. It's like someone designed this to be a gauntlet for anyone who dared to come in. Xenopolis may be the most unpopular stage in this game, but I find it endlessly captivating with its ideas and execution. Whenever I play this zone, I constantly think of how brilliant the design is. Real people brought this stage up. So much had to go into the making of this level. It's jaw-dropping if I'm being honest. Gosh, this game is just something else, man. The ambition for flows like nothing else. Same thing goes for Lava Reef. This zone is fucking amazing. You're descending deeper and deeper into this volcano. It has some of the best music in Sonic, and Act 2 blows me away with how significant it feels. No joke, once I saw the crashed death egg staring back at me, I was at a loss of words. Remember how I said the story and gameplay are connected? This is a great example. I did that! I was the one who took this thing down. And once it flashes and starts to rise, it feels like something bad is about to happen. Gosh, this game is so immersive and it's not even remotely funny. Act 2 also connects the Hidden Palace, where Knuckles is waiting for us to duke it out. 
and this fight is the butt of a lot of jokes, but it's really not that bad at all. I never had a problem with it. In fact, I find it quite fun. Also, it allows me to stare at the mural for a while. And man, I'm obsessed with this. It's the center of a lot of theories. The amount of lore jam-packed in this game is incredible. Sky Sanctuary is nothing short of brilliant. There's only one act this time around, but I kind of like that. This zone is special. It's holy ground, and we are here for one reason, the chase after the death egg. But my lord, does this stage look beautiful. It holds up today. If I saw this back in the 90s, I would have been speechless. I can't express how much I love this stage, the significance it has in the story, how the egg robots come off screen to try to stop Sonic, bouncing off the clouds, running up the rubble as it breaks away. That's what I'm talking about! That's why he's the MVP! That's why he's the GOAT! The GOAT! Not to mention Mecha Sonic. Who the fuck is this guy? Why the fuck is this guy? Where the fuck is this guy? He's literally one of the coolest designs in fiction, and the fact we never saw him again outside of the IDW comics is literally a crime. This will never be forgotten. And maybe that's for the best. It makes this game feel more special. More special than it already is. Now, uh, Jax, PLEASE make a figure out of this dude. You guys did it for Shard, do it for Mecha Sonic! Death Egg Zone is again, the best out of these levels. I love how it feels like you're actually inside of a huge spaceship. Let's not forget about how big the Death Egg actually is. We're not just in a small room like Sonic 2 or Flying Battery. This is the real deal. And the level design is so intricate. You're always on your toes no matter what. There's always something to look out for in this stage. Act 2 has you outside of the Death Egg. And again, once we see the planet in the background of a Sonic game, you know some serious stuff is about to go down. This is the best final level in any Sonic game. It nails the suspenseful feeling of almost being done with your adventure. So close, but yet so far. This leads me to talk about the bosses. And wow, we are straight dubbing here, because yet again, these are the best bosses in the entire lineup so far. Some of them are better than others for sure, but the good ones are good. A lot of them make good use of the elemental shields. Angel Island bosses die with the fire shield. Hydra Cities is good for bubble, and Carnival Night works for the electric shield. Shout out to Flying Batteries mini boss for being a capsule. You know, the thing we're always considered the end of level. Huge change up there. Again, the instant shield kind of breaks these in half, but honestly that's half the fun for me. The instant shield is really good at teaching the player how to time your hits well, so instead of feeling cheap, it feels like you legit mastered a skill. Lava Reef's boss often gets a lot of flack, but hate me if you will, but I love this fight as well. I love how it's a chase, jump from platform to platform is super intense, and it also gives you a fire shield right before it begins to take some of the stress off, but if you lose it, Oh boy, you're in for a long ride. I dig it. Also, the Sanopolis boss is just blissful. Nice. Death Egg's boss is fantastic. I love the sinister feeling. Also, destroying all the fingers is such an interesting concept and is executed really well. And I love the chase. And how you can get multiple shots in before Eggman fires the cannon. Also, nose fire. All of this is cool. However, it pales in comparison to what I'm about to show you. I don't care if any of you think I'm cringe for saying this, but this boss fight gives me chills. Everything was leading up to this point. It got so desperate that Eggman literally took the Master Emerald and made a run for it. We're not just putting an end to Eggman's new scheme of the week, we are quite literally saving the entire Earth from Eggman's terror. Sonic has no choice but to transform. The Death Egg Zone boss left with everything falling apart. There's only one way out, a final showdown in space. At the start of the boss, Sonic will have to transform, and let's take another listen here. This isn't actually confirmed, but Sonic is 100% screaming here. No one can convince me otherwise. If it wasn't screaming, why is the sound specifically different? Here's what he sounds like when he transforms normally. He's screaming. He's in so much danger, and he needs to harness his power. He lets it all out here. Sonic screams. Literally the embodiment of badass. And is literally one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And the boss is actually fun to play as well. Don't get me wrong. The high stakes is really cool, but the gameplay also holds up. You're dodging asteroids in space, catching up the Eggman to make sure he doesn't leave with the Master Emerald, and being hypersonic means your rings will slowly tick down, adding to that suspenseful nature. You have to hurry. There's no time to play around. You have to do this and get it right. Leading the missiles to hit Eggman instead of you is super cool, and that final chase where Eggman gets so desperate is so fun. Mashing Egg while slamming the robot is some of the most intense moments in any video game. I was screaming on the top of my lungs when I was first playing this boss. I felt like the fate of the entire world was in my hands, and when you finally beat him, one of the most rewarding feelings in the entire planet. 
Sonic the Hedgehog 3 is everything a third sequel should be. It not only refines an already established formula, but it perfects it with expansive maze-like level design, streamlined level layout, and even more special stages, items, and actual level to play with. The ambition of this one game is crazy. Sonic Team around this time going to the 2000s seemed like a small crowd and their ambition grew bigger and bigger, game after game. Sonic 2 was great, CD was different, but Sonic 3 was an entire epic. For a platformer game in 1994, the storytelling in this game is amazing and plays a huge part in making this game feel huge. This was the best Sonic game they could have ever made back then. Sonic Team kept going up and up, and this would continue in later entries. Sonic 3 may be the end to an era of the franchise, but in my opinion it would also start another part. Sonic 3 laid out the groundwork, Adventure and Adventure 2 would follow. Sonic 3 to fans is a holy entry, this right here is the best entry in the franchise, and I get down with it. Some may argue Sonic 3 has never been surpassed, but I don't think that's a good way of looking at it. Sonic 3 is what games should look to, and I feel like we got games on this level of ambition a few times. This game screams ambition, it's the definition of ambitious, the scope. The world, the music, the stories, it's all so grand. Before, you had to imagine the story play out in your head. Well, not this time. You are in the story. We are helping Sonic save the world. No joke, starting Sky Sanctuary gives me chills. Am I cringe? Yes, but honestly, I don't fucking care. If this was Pokemon, people would be wiping their tears to monsters being caught in balls. Let me enjoy my cool hedgehog stories, damn it. Some may argue that Sonic 2 is easy to pick up and play is better, but I just can't agree one bit. Sonic 3 is bigger. The bigger the better, I say. The grander the better, and the ambition in these zones are through the roof. I feel the scope of the world when I play. I feel the passion that was had with the dev team. I feel how everything was refined and perfected. Sonic 3 is what Sonic 2 is to the first game. It expands on that style of gameplay and perfects it. Sonic 2 is great, yes, but Sonic 3 is amazing. Sonic 2 doesn't have high stakes stories, mini bosses, and scope. Sonic 2 is a fun romp but Sonic 3 is an entire adventure. It's an epic. Sonic 3 was made for Sonic fans and it shows. And if it ever gets too much for you, simply turn the game off and continue from where you left off another time. The difficulty here has definitely been increased in Sonic 2. In a lot of ways, it feels like Sonic 3 was made for fans who could easily breeze through the other games. And I feel like that's also why some may prefer the second game. Sure, it's less challenging and that's fine, but for someone like me, who can play these games blindfolded, Sonic 3's difficulty is literally perfect. Like in this aspect, I can't think of a single critic for the game to improve on. It's enough to give me a good challenge while also easy enough for me to get through the game in a single sitting. But it wasn't always like that. When I was a kid, this game was hard as balls for me. I could hardly make it past Marble Garden. I preferred Sonic 2 purely because it was the one I could actually beat. It was only as I got older that my love for Sonic 3 started to flourish. The game's scope captivated me and encouraged me to keep trying. And once I finally got the best ending, it was the greatest feeling in the entire planet. Sonic 3 and Knuckles is the reason why most of us are even here. Sonic 3K is when Sonic stopped being a cool little platformer and started becoming something bigger, a huge franchise, a triple A success. Sonic 3 is a landmark title in not only Sonic, but video gaming in general. It was debatable if Sonic was better than Mario, but I think here is when Sega finally did it. They made a game that surpassed the original. Sonic 3 is one of the best games I have ever played in my entire life, and I hope I can at least give it a shred of justice in this video. If you haven't played this game already, I don't know what's wrong with you. Go play this game right now, or else I'll be really mad at you forever. Man, that was a lot. That's just how passionate I feel about this game. It's important. This game is special. It will always hold a special place in everyone's hearts. And the greatest part is, we're not done. Yeah, no kidding. Remember the option to play as Knuckles? Well, Knuckles acts as the sequel to this game. It canonically takes place after the events of Sonic 3. It seems Knuckles has some cleanup to do, because one of the Egg Robos survived and it's causing a bit of chaos on Angel Island. So as Knuckles, you go back through the land and take care of what's left of Eggman's army. Bro, imagine buying both Sonic 3 slash Sonic and Knuckles and finding out you get another story on top of this huge game already present. That's just the coolest thing in the entire world. And don't mistake this for a retread. Sure, the level design is pretty similar, but Knuckles will go through completely different portions of the level that Sonic can't access. Remember the rubble that you couldn't do a thing about? Well, Knuckles can break right through them. There will be times where you just can't progress as Knuckles where Sonic could, and you have to find another way around. Marble Garden feels way better as Knuckles in my opinion. This zone was clearly designed with them in mind, and it's really cool. Ice Cap is a highlight for me in particular. I love how it primarily takes place inside of the cavern. You're so deep inside that if you fall off, 
you will die. You would imagine a lot of this was half-assed, but it really wasn't. Launch Base's Knuckles is so cool. Act 2 as you running away from the rising water. Knowing you're not as fast and not having the abilities of Sonic is so scary. And my gosh, that's big arms. No wonder why it wasn't in the Sonic story. I actually really like this. The game ends at Sky Sanctuary, which makes sense. But it turns out Mega Sonic wasn't totally destroyed because we get another battle with them as the final boss. Sweet. This boss is super fun. Well, it's over now. Wait, what? The Master Emerald? Wait, what? what is he doing? Is he going super? What the fuck? Is- What the fucking shit? Super Mecha Sonic? What the fuck is that? That was exactly how I reacted when I first got here. Super Mecha Sonic. Yeah, you heard that right. Just when you thought Sonic 3 couldn't get any more cool, they dropped Super Fucking Mecha Sonic. Right as you think it's over, Mecha rushes over to the Master Emerald and harnesses his power. The boss itself is so freaking cool and fun to play. You see Mecha flying around and launching beams at Knuckles. It's the essence of awesome. I think what I said earlier really hits home. Mecha being a Sonic 3 only thing really adds to the iconic identity this game owns. This boss isn't on the same level as Doomsday for me, but it's damn close. And the concept of a Metal Sonic counterpart being able to transform is just the wildest and sickest thing ever. Something like this is the exact reason why I'm not really thrilled on how classic Sonic is portrayed today. This cutesy whimsical Sonic clashes severely with how cool it used to be, but that's for another day. Knuckles' story in Sonic 3 is so great because in my opinion it's just more Sonic 3 to enjoy. It feels so fresh to play after beating the original so many times. When first going through it, I was surprised and impressed with some of the ideas that were had here. Knuckles' story stands on its own. Hey, look at that. Another thing Sonic Team would keep going for the next couple of games. Now, I'm sure there's a few of you out there that's wondering what Sonic 3 does that later 2D games like Mania and Superstars doesn't. And well, I think the answer to that is actually quite simple to answer. Sonic 3 was made to be the best Sonic game of that time. Of its era. Of its generation. This was pushing the Genesis to its absolute limits in almost every regard. Versus Mania and Superstars where it was trying to be a game from the 90s. It favors to emulate the quote unquote good old days instead of being something groundbreaking. But that's no shade on those games. I just think there's a reason why Sonic 3 will remain on top. Even after all these years. So yeah. That was Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Now I'm not going to act like this is the end. Because if you've seen any review up to this point, you would know we look at the other versions too. But without any further ado, I welcome the grand return of Sonic Jam. Uh, yeah, I, I grabbed the wrong copy. Uh, we're keeping that, we're keeping that. It's been a hot minute since I talked about this one. Sonic Jam was released for the Sega Saturn back in 1997. It tried to get new players into the franchise considering that the Mega Drive wasn't very popular during its time in Japan. Instead of being emulated, these games were completely rewritten for the Saturn, meaning they could fix bugs, add stuff, and run more smoothly than the Genesis games. That and all is present for Sonic 3. Sonic 3 has a few bug fixes and general improvements, it runs smoother, and is overall a great experience on the Sega Saturn. The music remains the same, but why would that be an issue? Good question! Anyway, one of the more notable changes in this version is the updated sound effects. So basically, Sonic Jam gives quote unquote better sound effects, which I guess in a technical way they are better quality, but I don't know man, the new Blue Sphere sound sounds really weird. I'll never get used to it. But uh, yeah, that's basically all the changes. Every video, the Sonic Jam segment gets shorter and shorter, and that's because there really isn't a lot that needs to be done for Sonic 3. The original stands beautifully on its own. It's nice that it runs slightly smoother on the Saturn, but I would argue it's not as noticeable as Sonic 2 was. Alright, now let's take a look at the most recent remaster of this game. After Sonic Jam, Sonic 3 only made a couple of reappearances, but for the most part it went into legal limbo. Why? We will get into that shortly, but in the meantime, welcome Sonic Origins! I think by now I've established myself as the number one official Sonic Origins hater. I've literally complained about it three times now, so let's do a rapid fire on why I think Origins stinks. Life system is completely replaced with the shitty coin system, taking away any sort of satisfaction of getting points or rings. Severe lack of options, classic mode literally being the remake in 4.3, not the original ROM, having a clunky as hell saving feature despite Sonic 3 literally already having one. There has to be a better way of doing this. Again, as I've said before, Sonic Origins doesn't have one glaring flaw. It's a death by a thousand paper cuts. All these little issues to me affect Sonic 3 more than any previous game. There are some wacky choices made here, like being stopped in Angel Island Zone Act 1, or this big ring you literally can't access as Sonic. It's almost like they want to remove any little bit of fun I have with this game. Every time I get to a cool part, I'm like, 
Oh boy! Only to be let down because it was changed to be something lame. Not having lives or continues here is a serious bummer. You know how fun it was to watch that life count skyrocket as I play the game, or getting a continue? It takes away so much from this game. And no, I don't care that Sonic Superstars doesn't have any lives either. That game was designed with that in mind, Sonic 3 wasn't. This doesn't bother most people and that's completely fine dude. I just wish we got options. Literally a few checkboxes would fix everything. However, that's not to say there isn't anything that I don't like about Origins, because is far from it. Amy's now playable, which is really cool. They restored some beta elements, which I really appreciate. The Sonic and Knuckles title screen was actually turned into a cutscene, which is super awesome. New sprites were all made for the characters whenever you look up, go in a barrel, or attach onto something. In the original, while being super, you would just revert to a yellow regular Sonic, and that just looks wrong. And finally, Super Sonic has his own transformation button, which changes a lot more than you might think. Super Sonic even has his own theme, which is another beta thing. In fact, Origins to even have Sonic 3 had to change a few things. What do I mean by that? Well, see for yourself. Oh boy, Carnival Night! I can't wait! No! 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 Oh, sweet! Sonic 3! Oh. Oh, I see what this is. Alright, so everybody and their mother knows about the fact that the King of Pop himself was involved in the soundtrack of Sonic 3. Not only is it the reason why dozens of these tracks are still beloved to this very day, but it also had negative effects on Sega's will to re-release the game. I'm sure my good buddy Nick will talk about that at some point, but for now, let's discuss music. So Michael Jackson was involved with the production of the music for Sonic 3 although he's not entirely credited within the game itself. There are a few theories as to why this is, such as him not particularly enjoying the way the music sounded on the Genesis, or things happening around that time that made Sega want to distance themselves from MJ. I'm sure Nick knows the right one, but the main reason I bring this up is because it's the reason Sonic 3 has such an unfortunately limited release. Sonic 1 and 2 have enough ports to make entire video essays about that fact alone, but for the titular third entry, it's very scarce in comparison. And when the game is re-released, some audio tracks are flat out replaced. Most controversially, Carnival Night Zone, Ice Cap Zone, and Launch Base Zone. But there are some incidental ditties changed as well, like Knuckles' theme in the miniboss. Now personally, I think some of these tracks go pretty hard. Launch Base's Act 2 especially deserves a shout out from me. However, said music carries a certain stigma with it. A very unfortunate one. Firstly, these tracks straight up replace the original Genesis tracks. I can understand how anyone would be upset with that. But also, the first time the public heard these songs was in the Sonic and Knuckles collection for PC in MIDI format. Yeah, it pretty much butchers the entire soundtrack of the game. And case number two is just as bad. Sonic Origins. I'm not sure what Mr. Sonoe was thinking while adapting these tracks, but they're god-awful. Carnival Night especially, it sounds so wonky. Just another reason why Origins is not the definitive classic Sonic experience. Anyway, these tracks didn't originate from the PC collection. A few years ago, a beta version of Sonic 3 was dumped online thanks to Hidden Palace, and it was revealed that these tracks were there since day one, only replaced with what we know today as the originals. And these versions of the songs are what allow me to be able to confidently say I like them. With the original Genesis composition, we can hear how they were supposed to be heard. If you've never heard them, or are part of the crowd who have only heard the midis or origins renditions, I highly recommend you go listen to them. It's easy to find the tracks as they are, or even remasters that clean them up a little bit on YouTube. Plus, it's more Sonic 3 music. What else could you ask for? What else could I ask for? How about some actual good music? I am not a fan of most of these tracks at all. Sure, you could say these were always originally intended to be the zone's themes, but just because something is an original, doesn't make it better. Ice Caps is seriously weak. I love the MJ version. It was cool, chilly, it puts you into the mood. The Winter Wonderland theme doesn't really fit at all in my opinion. I have to say I agree with you on Ice Cap Zone. I like it on its own, but having it sound like a generic winter-themed level really takes away from the unique, crystal-filled, desolate vibe the MJ version has. But I highly prefer the other two. At least the Act 1 and Act 2 songs actually sound different. That's something I've always disliked about the MJ themes. Act 2 is just Act 1 song with minor differences, like a few missing instruments. Boring, in my opinion. I'll give you that. The original never bothered me, but having a pretty different Act 2 song is cool regardless. However, Carnival Night was straight up ruined. This sounds awful, I'm sorry. I loved how busy the MJ one was. It was annoying, but in the good way. It sounded so generic here. Everyone hated these tracks before they were confirmed to be the original. Why did most people suddenly switch up? 
Well, it's most certainly got something to do with how we've been listening to the MIDI versions of these tracks all our lives until they were revealed to be the originals. I'll agree with you to Helen Beck that those versions sound just awful, but I love this version of Carnival Night. It just makes me want to groove. The MJ version sounds like I'm waiting in line at the Clown Factory. You have to at least agree Launch Base Zone sounds good, right? Not even in comparison, just as its own song, eh? Oh, absolutely. I'll give you that Launch Base OG is way better than the MJ version. It feels triumphant. It feels like, oh shit, here we go. Things are about to get bad. And I really like that aspect. It fits with the theme of the game in my opinion. I still love the original, but yeah, original launch for the win. Also, yeah, those mini versions were bad. I can understand the perspective there. It just weirds me out how the MJ versions are now kind of obscure, and to new fans, those sound weird compared to the Origins version. Like that meme, okay grandpa, it's time to go to bed, while I'm screaming, MJ did the music for Sonic 3! I can definitely see where you're coming from too. I'm pretty upset that any future release of Sonic 3 probably won't have the classic MJ soundtracks. So it probably feels like the shitty Origins remakes are going to replace the perfectly fine ones we had. Sonic the Hedgehog 3 is not only a grade A platformer, it also carries within it musical legacy, as well as a gap between generations and their connection with song. What a marvel of a video game. Anyway, you just like the originals more because you're a purist. LOL. Okay. Jokes aside though, I think I like the MJ tracks more because I feel like it adds a lot of that unique identity. I think if the originals were used instead of the MJ, it would take a lot from the soundtrack as a whole and the uniqueness from the game itself. But that's just my opinion, unlike you NPCs that follow the bandwagon and gain their opinion from the masses. NPC? I'll have you know I like these tracks before. With all that being said, I've actually come to terms with how Origins is. Yeah, I find a lot to dislike about the game, but in a lot of ways, I'm a purist when it comes to the originals. I just don't think they need any updating. Oh my gosh, is she still yapping? Get out of here! Ah, okay, sorry, sorry. Anyway, over the last few months, I've been getting a lot of people coming to me and saying how they got Origins and how much they're enjoying it, even calling themselves new fans. And that's great. In the end, all I want people to do is play these games. I may have personal beef with this one, but if that's the only way you can experience Sonic 3, by all means, go for it. Not unless you got a PC! Sonic 3 Air is undoubtedly the best way to experience Sonic the Hedgehog 3. I know the creator of this fan remaster doesn't want people to compare it to Sonic 3 Origins, but uh... Look, I'm sorry, but I refuse to not compare the obviously better thing to the official product. That's just how criticism works. It's not weaponizing it, this is just the better thing, and you better believe I'm going to talk about it. My favorite thing about Sonic 3 Air is the fact you can customize so much about the experience. Everything you could want is here, lives are present, and it makes me feel like I'm playing the original. An achievement system was added, which is super cool. The more you get, the more you unlock. Like the drop dash, and this. Did he shoo me? Another thing I love about Air is the fact they added an option for Sonic's top speed animation being the peel-out sprite from CD and oh my gosh this is so cool. I love seeing the Sonic 3 sprite with a figure 8. I wish it was in the original game. In all, if you haven't played Sonic 3 Air yet, give it a shot. It's free and it's my favorite way to replay this game aside from the Genesis original. But yeah, that was my review for Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles. I truly believe that this is one of the best games ever made, and if any of you haven't played it yet, please give it a chance. I promise, I promise you might find at least one thing to enjoy from this title. Real quick before I end off this video, I just wanted to say that the support I've been getting on the Sonic CD videos have been absolutely amazing. I mean, just the comments saying like, Oh, you're so good, you deserve more subs. I don't think you guys understand how much that motivates me and how much it means to me. It motivates me more than you guys will ever know, really. It feels like I actually have an audience here now. Before, it always felt like I was making this for my friends and maybe a few other people. And don't get me wrong, I'm super passionate about this stuff and I'm going to continue to do it even if there's like one guy watching, right? But the fact it feels like I have an actual audience, like there's people asking me like, hey, when's it coming out? It, it blows my mind and I just want to say this is only the beginning of this channel seriously guys like thank you so much for all, everyone that's been subscribed you know um since the sonic cd video we're going on like what four or five hundred subs now so again seriously thank you all this is only beginning but what's next now i don't quite want to run sonic in the ground just yet there's plenty of other series i like sonic will always be on this channel don't get me wrong but it's time we do something next what will we do next I don't know. Guess I gotta wait to find out. 
Nick here from NNC Reviews signing out, and I'll see you guys next time.